All right, cool. So you've probably seen this uh, slide beaten to death at this point already. But our mission at AWS is to put machine learning in the hands of every single developer. Uh, and what does that look like? Well, it means we have to build an extremely broad and extremely deep set of capabilities to address every potential user out in the world. And we know that every single uh, you know, service doesn't always solve your problem exactly as it is off the shelf. But we'll, I'll show you over the course of this presentation how we've made lots of really meaningful feature launches over time, some as recent as reInvent, that help to fill in all of these gaps here. Uh, you know, I won't go down all of them, but really, from a broad perspective, we have everything from the most abstracted at the top for AI services, where the promise is uh, no need to manage your own infrastructure around these given services. You can plug your data into these off-the-shelf APIs, and some of which you actually have the ability to train with, all without managing the underlying infrastructure. SageMaker, on the other hand, helps you dive a little bit deeper into messing around with the underlying primitives. And at the bottom, we have everything from the improvements we make to open source equivalents of frameworks like TensorFlow to the EC2 uh, instances that underpin a lot of the magic that happens up the stack. And as a result of this, more customers choose AWS for machine learning than anywhere else. Uh, this is no surprise. Again, uh, th there's, there's reasons why the broadest and deepest set of capabilities uh, serves the broadest audience. Uh, and, and our customers really, really enjoy that. If you Know anyone from any of these companies, just talk to them, and I'm sure they would uh, love to expand on that. I have some customer examples later that are more topical to the services. Uh, but today, I'm talking to you about computer vision. So we're going to narrow in on two of the services in particular, uh, them being Amazon Recognition there on the top left under vision, uh, as well as Amazon Textract. Uh, these are, again, two services in the AI services category here along the top. Uh, and you know, I hope that uh, this inspires you to take a look at some of the other AI services, because they're really powerful and very dynamic. Uh, some more than they let on at first glance. So I mentioned before that compute and many things at AWS uh, sort of arrive on a spectrum. There aren't just a discrete set of customers that exist in the wild where we can just build X number of services and then everyone is satisfied eternally, right? The, the world of technology consistently uh, evolves and machine learning is definitely no exception. It happens at an extremely breakneck pace. So we have sort of this, this uh, you know, axis here from most abstraction to least abstraction. And if we think about the services we offer here, at the bottom we have EC2, Lambda, API Gateway, a lot of traditional primitives you have for software deployment and management. And at the top we have the completely abstracted equivalents of those for a lot of common use cases. So we think translation, transcription of audio to text, uh, you know, label detection and images, and so on here at the top of the AI services. SageMaker came along down the line as a way of being able to abstract the bottom layers, where instead of having to be an infrastructure guru, if you can manage the AWS SDKs, you can do things like spin up a distributed cluster of you know, GPU instances and, and, and train and parallelize your entire training task all with a single API call. SageMaker makes that really accessible to a lot of developers. And then down the line we saw, well, a lot of folks want to train their own models, but they didn't have labeled data for supervised learning. This is a necessary prerequisite. So we released SageMaker Ground Truth. Uh, this is a tool that essentially helped broaden the applicability of SageMaker by helping developers ab be able and their organizations to be able to label their data to then enter the supervised learning pipeline. But we still see some sort of gap between off-the-shelf models and, and customers who really want to train their own models, typically on their own data. And we see this over some of the newer AI services uh, that, you know, these aren't ones that have, uh, Fraud Detector is one that has launched at this reInvent, but even as, as far back as last reInvent, we've launched Personalize, we've launched Forecast. Uh, these are services that, while they are completely managed, where you don't manage any of the infrastructure for training or deployment, you still have SDK uh, plugins, essentially, that enable you to uh, incorporate your own custom data and train your own model with the knowledge and expertise that we have learned for training and doing auto ML from a personalization perspective, as well as a time series forecasting perspective. We've done a lot of that at Amazon. Uh, we used to be a small indie bookstore. Now we sell everything, uh, so it seems, at least. Uh, and so forecasting helps to, to provide that to you. Fraud Detector is another way of being able to provide this uh, from the millions and millions and millions uh, of you know, si account signups and purchases that we've seen at Amazon. And, and we enable you to plug in your own data still in a fully managed way. Uh, but one of the most interesting ones that I'll talk about today in the vision space is recognition with custom labels. Because there was a really big gap before, in my opinion, between being able to use an off-the-shelf object detection model for you know, many of the very common objects that exist in, in the world and training your own uh, custom model to identify the objects that are meaningful to you. Uh, and recognition custom labels uh, is, is, is the step in the right direction there, and it's very exciting. So broadly, the value of the AWS AI services are that they're often pre-trained or they incorporate uh, a lot of the knowledge that we have learned from our adventures and from our top machine learning scientists at AWS. And they don't require you to train that knowledge in-house, either in the form of uh, you know, building those own models from scratch yourself or in-housing that talent. The next, you can 
integrate it really easily. Your developers, you know how to use SDKs and APIs, and that ease of use and ease of integration is, is primed to how quickly you can go to market with your features. And then lastly, these APIs, you're not signing up for a finite type of fixed accuracy or, or a fixed level of effectiveness. These APIs actually get better over time because our machine learning scientists continuously improve them and launch updates to the model. Oftentimes, uh, they have entirely new functionality or higher orders of functionality that they would not have had previously. So you're investing in using a tool that constantly gets better. Okay, so first, I mentioned I'm gonna go through two main services. Recognition is the first one. Uh, this is deep learning based image and video analysis. Uh, so recognition, broadly, as its name kind of implies, it's able to recognize through the application of machine learning uh, information in images and video. And uh, while it might, might have started out with just a few points of functionality, we've seen this really grow over time. So we, do, we can do everything from uh, facial detection and analysis to uh, matching for celebrities is always a fun one. Uh, understanding labels and what is actually inside of your images and videos is, is extremely important for cataloging and search. Uh, understanding text from given images in the world is, is clearly a very valuable proposition, and then so on. Everything from scenes, paths, activities, uh, and moderation. These are sort of one level of abstraction above some of these uh, more fundamental characteristics about an image like text or labels to determine things like, is a piece of content safe for work? Uh, you know, is a person or a face in an image facing a certain way like this skier? And, and what is the direction that they're moving? Recognition enables you to figure all of this out through API calls. Okay, so. You're gonna see a trend here. A lot of these benefits are nearly identical to the, the broad AWS AI service benefits that I mentioned before. Uh, you're getting state-of-the-art machine learning uh, and computer vision functionality out of recognition with an off-the-shelf API that enables you to integrate really rapidly. You own your own data because you're not training your own model on recognition. Uh, it's completely serverless. It is. It trains up, uh, it's, it's completely serverless in that you can invoke it from any number of clients concurrently. So a big benefit of you using this managed service is that we handle the underlying provisioning and scaling up and scaling down. You don't pay for latent hardware, all you pay for is a per request basis. So if you go from zero traffic to 10,000 users all hitting some sort of authentication endpoint for recognition that requires like a facial matching feature, we handle that all and you don't get a, a, a surge premium or anything along that and we guarantee that it'll work. Uh, within the bounds of the SLA, obviously. Uh, and, and, and low cost, there are generous free tiers to all of this, and I think that as you spend more, uh, as you spend more and, and use the services more, there are benefits to economies of scale when it comes to pricing. Okay, so what is this used for? Obviously, there's a lot of uh, clear sort of uh, benefits of those features, but, but what, what does this look like out in the wild? Um, so here are some examples of industries where we see recognition being used widely. Media discovery, and anybody that deals with a large amount of media, either picture or video, uh, it, it's important to be able to both search for it but catalog and index it. Uh, customer engagement, if you wanna understand how customers are interacting with your brand or objects, you can get better insight about that through these pictures, uh, through analysis of these pictures and videos. Every, moderation spans the gamut, everything from making safe content for users of your platform but also public safety. Uh, human trafficking is obviously an immense problem in our world. Uh, and, and there are a lot of really great customers using recognition out in the wild to help use technology like recognition to help curb uh, like illegal human trafficking. Uh, so some really cool use cases out there. Uh, as well as industrial, like if you want to be able to map where certain entities or objects are moving throughout a factory or a production floor, recognition helps you out immensely there. So first, uh, let's dive deep a little bit on uh, facial use cases here from recognition. So recognition is able to do quite a few things. But one of the ones, uh, one of the feature sets and use cases that I think is most resounding is the ability to perform a face matching for a given entity or a user that you have added to a collection in your system. So again, in recognition world, you're not managing any infrastructure. So what does this look like? You want to add a user to a given collection. Maybe it's a user, maybe uh, it's a user that signs up for your app and you want to have multi-factor authentication at some point in time. Uh, so what happens is you can add a user to the collection, and what happens here is uh, an image that you pass in, actually uh, the pertinent specific facial features that are unique to that individual uh, are extracted and then hashed. So the data that's actually stored in the collection cannot be reverse engineered to create the image or the source image that, that, that created it. So by definition, when you add a user to a collection, the actual image data gets scrapped in the end uh, on the recognition side, apart from what your lifecycle management is, and a, uh, basically an encrypted hash of their unique identification is stored. And what this enables you to do is that whenever you want to perform a check in the future, let's say someone wants to send uh, you know, $1,000 in US, US dollars to someone else, that's a pretty big uh, transaction to be spending, you may want to have some sort of two-factor authentication that requires them to take a picture of themselves while they're doing that. 
Uh, and so recognition can easily enable that. So once a user's in the collection, you can actually check the hash for the user's face that you know, you've sent the new picture in for and see if it matches the hash of the old one. Very common, we see this across any uh, large number of customers for regardless of what industry you work in because multi-factor authentication uh, is very important. Okay, so I mentioned before that brands understanding how you as a user are interacting with their goods or just in their space uh, is something that's it's immensely valuable. So this is again sort of a two-tiered approach. First, with recognition, we can do object scene and activity detection. So here we have labels uh, listing you know, accessories, sunglasses, driving as an activity. Uh, notice it doesn't just say steering wheel, right? It, it is uh, contextually understanding that there is a steering wheel, there is a person behind it, and, and by that person interacting with that steering wheel, we can assume that they're in the, the act of driving. Uh, this is a higher order feature that is significantly more difficult for you to train uh, if you're to build your own model. But again, this type of higher order activity is an example of what has been released throughout gradual model updates as time has gone on. That was, those higher order activities were not there when it was first launched, but they're continuing to be coming out uh, hand over fist. Uh, and then here on the right, you know, we have glasses. Uh, but what's even more valuable than some of these is understanding some more metadata about our users, uh, especially when you're running any sort of a brand awareness or a brand understanding or market intelligence sort of campaign. Uh, let's say you have a good, it's a physical good, and users can talk or, or tag you uh, on Instagram or whatever social media platform du jour uh, that you prefer. Now, typically, you would want to know what users are saying about your good. And, and obviously, understanding word by word is great, but that's also very manual, very tedious. Um, we can get everything from demographics of our users, like this person on the right with glasses, uh, their, their gender, their age, approximate age, uh, and other characteristics like not smiling. Uh, this may be important because if you have the majority of users using your product, that, uh, product that should be making them happy, not smiling in pictures, or uh, the worse, actively upset, uh, something's going wrong, right? And with recognition, you can actually automate this analysis as opposed to having to have someone sit down with all the images and, and start doing tallies and, and qualitative analysis uh, when you can automate this in a completely serverless batch fashion uh, with recognition. Okay, so I mentioned before the example of two-factor authentication. Uh, I was actually just talking to someone uh, before who's here at the conference. I don't know if they're in this talk right now. Uh, but as a part of their uh, financial app, they have multi-factor authentication for transactions and sign up and so on. Again, really common use case. Uh, one customer that does this, IAEA Credit, they use this for real-time identity verification. Uh, they provide instant loans to individuals, microloans. There's lots of companies all around the world that do this for their respective locales, and they're experts at knowing uh, what users want and, and prefer and how fraudulent behavior happens in that given region. Uh, but a primary vector for being able to perform multi-factor authentication, again, would be something like facial recognition to confirm that the ID you signed up with, uh, something like either a state or a national ID that's hard to replicate or verify, or hard to, hard to uh, fake, um, can be compared to the user when they're performing a certain action that could be risky. Um, Immensely valuable AI, AI credit that does this, and they don't need human intervention. So something that was either a situation where they can do it completely manually, spend a lot of money, and have really long turnaround times on approval for these loans, or they just let everything through, and then they don't automate any sort of two-factor authentication, and they suffer from a bunch of fraudulent activity. Uh, now they've moved from that you know, false choice of, of two really bad scenarios to an automated scenario where it can be both instant and achieve the functionality that they want. Uh, and again, they didn't have to in-house any computer vision experts to be able to do this. Recognition did this right off the shelf through the built-in detect faces method. Okay, I mentioned before activities and paths. Let's just go down that rabbit hole uh, for just a moment. So I displayed a picture of a skier before, uh, and so this is really interesting. So I mentioned that uh, you know, we have higher order features that build on top of the functionality of some of the more uh, primitive features. And so when it comes to facial detection, uh, not only can we detect you know, the outer bounding box for a given face, uh, but we can actually understand a little bit more than that, and that's that obviously necessary for, for being able to do identity verification. Uh, but we, what we can actually do here is uh, recognition under the hood can figure out the uh, positions of all of the pertinent features of one's face. So think the eyes, the nose, uh, the eyebrows. And, and with all of these uh, main data points, think of someone wearing like a motion capture mask, let's say. Uh, we can actually take an orthogonal projection out from the front of their face to assume the directionality of where they're going. Uh, so again, that, that, that orthogonality is not inherently machine learning, but it uses the, the parameters and, and the data that's returned by recognition in order to achieve that. 
Uh, so that's, that's really cool. And, and so in a sports scenario like this, you can actually assume where players may be going on the screen. So imagine a scenario where um, you know, a player instantaneously turns and, and, and turns very sharply. You could have some sort of real-time projection uh, if you're using, let's say, like recognition video uh, to be able to assume that they're going to bolt in another direction. Imagine this in a, in a soccer or an American football game um, or baseball, I don't know. There are lots of sports where this could be, obviously be very topical. And then beyond that, text, uh, and much like all user data in the wild, is messy. Uh, we know this, you know this if you've ever assumed that you, know, you ask your user to take a picture head on and, and a few come in like this, but then some come in like this and others come in like this and others they're like in front of a spotlight so it's like completely washed out and others it's way too dark. Um, data is dirty in the wild and it means that it won't always behave the way we assume it will. Uh, obviously this is the case for many things, but especially so in machine learning. Uh, and what I mean by dirty is that when you expect to do something like text recognition uh, on, on signs or, or just anything out in the wild, text takes many uh, shapes and forms. You know, It's not always size 12 times New Roman on a computer screen that's bright enough for you to see in front of your face. Uh, so when we're looking at things like traffic signs and, and business signs, uh, not only do they have things like varying fonts, varying sizes, varying kernings for thickness of the font, uh, but even just styles of the font. So you see there on the right, uh, that's some sort of old-timey, medieval-esque font. Um, and, and again, if you're trying to train your own model to be able to do this, often what this means is that for every single letter of every type of glyph, so in you know, the, you know, this type of English alphabet, you would need uh, an example of every lowercase letter, every uppercase letter, every symbol. Uh, and, and in Hindi, you'd need a, a similar equivalent for every single symbol and character in every single type of stylization. This becomes really, really difficult. Um, but thankfully, with new features that have been launched in Textract, things, uh, processing this data through the detect text method has become even easier. So everything from the angle of the image or the angle of the text being off or inconsistent uh, has been a problem in the past for all types of OCR, optical character recognition. Uh, and, and, and various fonts have made that nigh on impossible to get some sort of consistent behavior. Uh, but text uh, recognition, the tech text method has done a really good job of improving that. So even for users that are in motion or uh, you know, vary, varying font sizes and occlusion, like we see the runners in the bottom, uh, it's usually really, really good at being able to still access that effectively. All right, so I mentioned before that moderation and safety of content is, uh, is a very big deal, uh, and it is. But I think there's a little more to just returning whether an image is some arbitrary person's definition of safe or not safe. So instead, what we do is we give you the option to make that, asser that, that assertion on your own. So we will return more granular aspects of what uh, are unsafe characteristics of the image. So here we see that uh, we have two main categories, explicit nudity and suggestiveness, and we have multiple different second order categories that you can you know, also parse from, from a data perspective. And so what this means is that there are many scenarios in which one of these subcategories may be okay, but all of the others may not. And what this basically means is at the end of the day, you have the ability to, even without training your own model, decide how your application will behave based on this granular feedback without needing to go and train your own model because an off-the-shelf solution didn't work for you. This is a prime example, these subcategories of, of, of when a service first launches and it, 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 uh, you know, it has that functionality and that promise, but we find through talking to customers that there are scenarios that either fall through the cracks or don't work as we initially intended. And that feedback drives 95% of our product and feature roadmap. So really excited to see this go out the door uh, and you know, this, this has really helped a lot of the customers because uh, every single use case is, is different in some way, shape, or form, and we want users to be able to decide that on their own uh, without us having to make some sort of blanket statement that leaves people hanging. Okay, so that's the core fundamentals of recognition. Um, we have detect faces, we have detect labels or objects, and then we have detect text. Uh, many of the features and the uh, functionalities that I described are then inherited from some of those methods or, the, or, or are reliant on the results of those methods. Uh, so I figured I could just show you some example architectures for all of those and then we could dig into uh, what it looks like to use the SDK, maybe show you a little demo real quick and then get on to the other services. So recognition architectures. This is gonna be some sort of straightforward batch processing. So I mentioned before that recognition as a service is inherently serverless. Um, this means you don't manage any of the underlying infrastructure. This means that when your uh, traffic spikes, your, your, your infrastructure scales accordingly along with it. Uh, but again, you don't worry about any of those costs. You're only paying on a per request basis. Uh, latency remains consistent regardless of your traffic, so on. Such are many of the tenants of uh, core fundamental service, core serverless uh, services. 
So what we have here is input on the left, either images or videos. Uh, again, this is batch, this is not real time, I'll get into that in just a second. So you have either, let's say, an image or a video that's uploaded to Amazon S3, uh, you know, cloud data store, can scale to any amount of objects. Uh, and so upon upload to S3, let's say your user just uploaded an image uh, upon account creation, we can use that S3 event upload as a CloudWatch trigger for our Lambda. What this enables us to do is essentially, for those that haven't used Lambda before, it's, uh, it's, it is a cloud serverless function that can be triggered by a variety of different events or invoked manually. Uh, so what we can do is this, the upload event is an automatic event in S3, and when we create our Lambda to do something, it's, it's our serverless compute layer, uh, we get the context of the object that was uploaded. So we upload an image to S3, then that event, we can actually pass along the, uh, you know, the URI to that given image to our Lambda and say, hey, Lambda, you want to do something with this? And then we write a little bit of code in Lambda. We're probably going to call out to the Amazon recognition API and say, OK, uh, Bodo3 recognition, tell me the labels that are in this image. That takes you know, a few like tens of milliseconds. Uh, the response comes back. Let's say I upload a picture of, you know, I have a cat or dog app. I upload a picture of a cat. The recognition tells me, all right, yeah, you got a cat there. Awesome. Uh, and then I decide what I want to do, right? Let's say maybe I put the cat image in the cat folder. I put dog images in the dog folder. Simple example, uh, but you know, it's, uh, it, it's straightforward uh, from a batch processing perspective. And the same would apply for a video. Again, this is not a live stream video. This would be a uh, video that's already compiled that you would then upload. Now, you're probably wondering that whole you know, result and decision part. Uh, that could get a little dicey, right? So recognition will tell you along with the label, along with the text, something called a confidence value. Uh, this is directly derived from the, uh, the, the underlying model that causes that inference or that prediction for the text or the face boundary. Uh, and it will actually say on a scale of uh, 0 to 1 or 1 to 100 uh, how confident it is that that is the either true value or that that is what you all, what we believe it to be. Uh, and so what that enables us to do is then act accordingly not just to the label, uh, but also to the confidence interval. And this makes a lot of sense if we think about it. Right? So if, if an image comes in and my model says 100%, that's a cat, like I can basically hear it meowing, right? Um, that's, we, we probably want to just send that directly to the cat folder. Uh, but in another scenario where maybe it's, I don't know, it's a, you have a lot of dogs in your data set that may look similar to cats or that cat has been having a really rough few years uh, and it looks something like a dog, that, that, that result may not be all too accurate, right? Uh, and so we may want to send that to a human reviewer so that they can get a second look at that. A lot of folks who look to implement AI, uh, automated AI systems think it's kind of all or nothing, that uh, they have to either manually review everything or uh, automate everything, and once they've automated it, they're paranoid, so they're just going to have human reviewers look over all of the results. And that's really not the case. With, with services like recognition, where you can return the confidence value for these given predictions, you can actually route the least likely results to be accurate to human reviewers, so you kind of get the best of both worlds. Uh, all of the ones the model is very confident in can go straight through, and, all, and the others that it may be on the fence at for, which you get to decide the threshold of, uh, can go to a human reviewer, and then you can make a decision based on that. So you know, a little bit of the best of both worlds. Uh, this exact same scenario, uh, we've actually had a recent feature launch. I believe this was at reInvent. Uh, it's abbreviated as A2I. I know the font's a little hard to hear, but uh, hard to read. But it stands for Amazon Augmented AI. Uh, essentially what this is, is it's a system by which you can more easily route your predictions to get humans in the loop. So you see on the left, you have input data. We call the AI service. In this instance, it was, it was recognition. Um, you, you feed that directly into Amazon Augmented AI, and it handles and manages sort of that handoff based on a threshold you can set directly in the console or, or in a config file. Uh, and it will automatically handle either routing to a human, routing directly to your end destination, um, and what have you. All right, next up, I said we were doing batch before for both images and videos. Uh, but now we're going to talk a little bit about streaming, right? So this makes a lot of sense. It, there, there are a lot of scenarios where you have video that's coming in in real time. So uh, I uh, consume a lot of live video on Twitch.tv. I, I watch a lot of gamers. Um, I, I stream developer shows on Twitch. So I, I deal with a, quite a bit of live video, but also sports, news. There are lots of scenarios where being able to process data directly as it comes in, uh, where we can't wait for the final output, is very important. So what does this look like? You start with the video. It's streaming in real time. There's a live connection that's open. You probably have some sort of WebSocket that you are then instantiating with an AWS service or whatever service is, is processing this. Uh, in AWS world, this would likely be Kinesis video streams, where you can ingest data continuously directly from the sort 
uh, from the source and then perform actions on that in some way, shape, or form. So uh, we can have things like you know, right, at, right, at, right at the fire hose for the Kinesis data stream, we can get some sort of basic analytics on it. But what we'd really be interested in doing is actually understanding the labels that are in it in real time. Uh, what if we could actually have a real time not safe for work detector where uh, I don't know how, how global this sort of incident was, but there was a Super Bowl where there was like a wardrobe malfunction uh, and midway through the show, uh, you know, like someone's like dress came off and that was a really big deal, right? Like what if you could have a system that guaranteed you that uh, if you ran on like a two second delay or something or, or like a one second delay, you could, you could promise that like recognition would catch that uh, and you know, it wouldn't be shown on national TV to millions and millions of people. Uh, pretty cool functionality, right? But it extends to everything else, even from just understanding the labels and the objects are, that are moving around in the scene to uh, in a sporting match, you may have multiple players all moving around and running on the field. You may want to be able to track those players' motions for some sort of higher order analytics. So imagine like uh, after, right after a play happens, they wanna show an instant replay with overlays over the players. Uh, you can use recognition video to then superimpose things because you have the locations at every timestamp along the video of the players in that play as it's happening. And you don't have to wait for an editor to go in and you know, compile a tape uh, for what you want to show right away. Uh, once it's, you know, you're feeding it into recognition video, uh, you can then read the, you know, analyzed output. Uh, and, and the scenario I mentioned before where you're superimposing, let's say, overlays over a player to show it whether they're, they're being blocked or uh, coverage in a field, for example, uh, like in an outfield in baseball or in cricket, I'd imagine. Um, that, that could be a really cool use case. And you can then send that video stream back to a Lambda, which then does something. Uh, in this case, instead of transmitting the video directly back to the client or to another server to then be used in post-production, uh, here what we see is Amazon SNS, simple notification serv uh, service. So in this pipeline, the end result is probably looking for some sort of uh, label that happens in real time. Uh, and what will happen at the result, uh, in the result of this is in real time, as the stream is occurring, when a label is detected by recognition, it will send a notification to a destination of your choosing. Could be your phone, could be, you know, like, a notification that like, hey, you should check on this. This thing is happening in this video, for example, right? Uh, the possibilities are endless. All right, so I promised we'd do a demo. Uh, so I have this demo here. Uh, this is a screenshot of the demo, but we'll open it up in just a second. So recognition obviously has a ton of functionality. I don't have the time to demo all of them, but object detection is always a really fun one. So I have this live site uh, that I'm gonna go to in just a second, and I have the code, it's all open source. Uh, don't worry, I have some slides also at the end that have all of these links, but yeah, feel free to take pictures and you'll get all the slides also. So, all right, let's go over to this live site. So again, I said we had multiple, oh, I have to exit the PowerPoint. All right, cool. So, uh, this is a lot of text. It's really just explaining recognition. This is under the assumption that someone has stumbled upon my site and, and not heard this uh, past 30 minutes, but I'm gonna take a picture and see what the labels are, so let's see. All right, so these will come in in just a moment. Uh, they'll populate here on the left with labels and confidence values. So we see here we have person, human, crowd, face, uh, tie, maybe it thinks because I'm wearing a button-down shirt that there's a tie also. Accessory, press conference, because I guess like I, it thinks I'm at a podium. Um, so you can see that, you know, some interesting results. Let's see if I hold up like my phone, for example. Maybe It's kind of hard to tell it's a phone, but We'll see how it changes things. Oh, there we go. Phone, electronics, cell phone, mobile phone, person. Oh, and there at the bottom, we actually have iPhone. I don't know how easy that is to see, but yeah. So I, I, this is like this model is constantly being updated. I actually don't remember the last time I saw iPhone on there. I wouldn't be surprised if this is one of the newer classes that have since been added to recognition. Uh, so when I say it's consistently being updated, as someone who uses the service a lot, I'm still constantly surprised at the higher level sort of analysis that recognition is able to do. Um, I don't really have anything else that's super interesting up here to hold up, unfortunately. Here, toss it. There we go. All right. Three, two, oh, three, two, one. Water bottle. Mineral water. Interesting. There we go. Thank you. And again, at uh, 98, 99% uh, confident. So, Again, you know, you can route your request. If, if it wasn't entirely sure that it was an iPhone, you saw that there were different confidence values for the, the higher level of, of analysis uh, than there were at the fact that it was a cell phone. It was very confident that it was a cell phone. Um, so again, you can, you can route your behavior accordingly. So that's recognition, uh, you know, sort of in action. And I figured I would also sling some code here if I am uh, able to, to just show you how easy it is to, to start getting used, uh, to start using. 
So this is Python. How many people use Python here in the audience? All right, a good number of you. I'll try not to embarrass myself. Uh, so first, we're going to start off with an import. Uh, we're going to import Boto3. That's the canonical AWS SDK. Uh, we're also going to import IO, because we're going to basically grab an image from our system uh, and feed it through recognition and see what it thinks. So next, we want to instantiate a client. Uh, so we'll just call it recognition. Recognition equals Boto3.client. Uh, so if you're instantiating any sort of client for any of the various AWS services, this is what this will look like. And then you just have to specify that this is a recognition client. So I run this. Oh, I'll pump that font up. There we go. All right. So we have a recognition client. What this enables us to do, if we do you know, help on recognition, you know, this is just the doc strings you can read, or you could go to the docs yourself. Um, but basically, what we're going to want to do now is, is pull in uh, an image from our system. So let's say the image path is, uh, I have it called like a folder called demo picks. Uh, and let's say I'll let you pick the one we analyze. Does this one look good? This is like a funny picture of me on Launchpad. We could do detect labels or detect uh, text for this one. What do you want? Just yell text or labels. Text. OK, cool. We're going to use this one. Uh, detect text example. Too many tabs. All right, so detect text example.jpg. All right, so we have to do this funky sort of with open uh, image path. RB for permissions as image. Uh, then we need to get the file, which will be image.read. And then recognition accepts one of two data input formats. You can either stream the bytes directly to it in the instance of an image, um, or you can give it an S3 URL, URI. Uh, that's going to be very common if you're building some sort of pipeline or workflow. Uh, but we'll just do bytes since it's my local. Um, it's coming from my local system. So we're going to pass in a byte array. Uh, cool. So that didn't error. We'll find out if that worked in a second. And then also, recognition is going to require a dictionary uh, to, to basically say, like, hey, I'm passing in bytes instead of an S3 URL. And the bytes are going to be what I have there in variable B. So if everything worked according to plan, we can call recognition.detect text, I think it was, right? And then we're just passing in for the image uh, the image object that I have written here. All right. And we will see what it says. All right, so this is our response. Text detections, it's going to detect multiple ones, and also it will return the confidence values. So we have, uh, let's see if we can get it back open. So yeah, so it looks like a bug, right? It's like, oh, I only see security. But you see the pillar actually uh, obfuscates. And so you see security here, the tail end of security. All right, cool. Notice that this is like not a very high resolution image either. That's, that's a very small piece of text at an angle, uh, blurred and occluded with some sort of style over it as well. Um, but it was able to, to understand that. You get the bounding boxes for the entirety of it. So with this data, this is the treasure trove of what I want to do next after that. And that's where we want you to be as a developer, right? We want to abstract away the hard part of getting that text so that you can figure out what makes your customers happy with this. So we detected the text security in the top. Uh, we'll look for Lum. We'll also look for Dolly. Uh, but also, the one we probably were hoping the most for, at least I was, was my name, because uh, it's on that lower third graphic. And we see that with 99.86% uh, you know, likelihood. Uh, again, oh, and my title here, down here as well. All spelled according to plan. Uh, and if we look back at the image, you know, it's, uh, it, it's a really good contrast. This is what you would want in a text detection sort of example. Uh, but it's also not a very high resolution image, right? So Anytime you can get a higher resolution image, the results are always going to be better. Uh, but I would say, oh, we look here, com, that was available there as well. Um, so overall, I'd say that was pretty much a success. What would you say? Yeah? All right, at least my Python didn't error. OK, cool. So that's recognition in a nutshell. Uh, and that's what it looks like to use. The code that I showed you on that website before is actually uh, in JavaScript and React. And the uh, one I just showed you, obviously, is in Python. So pick your poison. Uh, let's play from here and keep the show rolling. All right, I've got to make up for time, so I have to talk even quicker, apparently. 
So OK, I mentioned before that we're filling in the gaps over time between the services to meet you, the customers, where you are in the wild. So you know, we've heard time and time again that customers want an off-the-shelf object detection API like recognition, but that they also want to be able to have one or two labels that they care a lot about incorporated into that image. And they don't want to have to go through the whole song and dance of training their own machine learning model, training and learning SageMaker or, or the underlying frameworks like TensorFlow. It's just a huge commitment for someone to learn if all they want is this one extra label, like their own logo or this new unique object. Uh, so we recently launched at reInvent recognition custom labels. And what this enables you to use is the underlying recognition service with a new endpoint or method that enables you to add a custom image where recognition will retrain uh, upon initiation on, on your end over the SDK. So again, all managed infrastructure. Uh, and it will learn to be able to detect this new image. So you have to provide a set of images with the boundaries and you know, the cropping to designate what the image is that you're trying to have labeled uh, with the according label. So here, this is an obscure object, uh, it's a torque converter for, for vehicles and cars. Um, and so obvious, I shouldn't say obviously, but you know, this is an obscure item that may not appear in our, in our, in our broad recognition model. Um, but now you can essentially get the best of both worlds where you can incorporate this uh, edge case into, uh, into recognition and still have it be a completely managed pay per request service. Um, so by supplying a small number of data, uh, pieces of data, you can now get this functionality without having to wrangle the underlying infrastructure. Great, okay, so that was 38 minutes and I'm through only recognition and now I have text tracked. I'll go quickly. Um, I'm also going to be giving multiple variants of this at uh, the round table and beyond. Um, so we'll go fast. All right, documents are important. Many industries use them. <laughs> uh, in, in the US, and as you know, most countries in the world have taxes, they need to be processed in some way. Uh, despite the ability to digitize so many things in our world, apparently taxes still have to be filed uh, you know, on pen, with pen and paper, at least in the United States, to the tune of 240 million of these pieces of paper. So there's a lot of documents in this world. We need to process them. Many reasons to either search and discover the information within them, uh, to be compliant with a government organization, uh, or to just automate a process that takes your company a lot of time to do all of the time. And today, there's a few ways that's done. Either someone sits there with pen and paper reading the piece of pen and paper or enters that data manually into a system. We use an off-the-shelf OCR, optical character recognition model, uh, but there are a lot of drawbacks to these. And last, we have rules and template-based extraction, which work when they work, but they don't work for a lot of the time. And that's the common pitfall there. So documents are expensive, They're, and processing is, is error prone and time consuming, and these are often all of the things that point to, hey, I should probably automate this. OK, so why are documents really hard to automate the processing for, like OCR and, and you know, template matching? So this is an example of, of, of a set of fields from a tax document. Uh, if you could tell me what all of the keys and values are and what those acronyms mean and, and all of that, uh, I would give you a gold star. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is that this is like an actual real form. And, and if you had to build some sort of rule-based processing around this, that'd be really difficult. But even just to you know, process this manually, I feel like a logical person who doesn't have context here could come up with a lot of very different interpretations. And at the end of the day, it's not just the experts processing these forms, but the, the common people that have to fill them out. Uh, so every American has to fill out forms like this. And you can see how these are a lot of different ways of interpreting that exact same form. And they could have entirely different meanings to the person filling them out. So variable output, inconsistent results. You may need a lot of people to double check. All right, next up, OCR, the dream of being able to process in an automated fashion, right? Well, there's a few caveats. First is that it only works for simple documents. So you can imagine those like visa forms where you have the individual blocks where you fill one character in per block. It only really works in those scenarios. Uh, even then, it's error prone. You probably imagine those scantrons where if you bubbled like ever so slightly out of the box, uh, everything just broke and your teacher failed you. Uh, no, just me. Okay, yeah, so it's error prone, but you know, we don't want to accept that standard, and we haven't really accepted it, but we've just went with it because it was the best we've had in the past. Um, and lastly, when it comes to flat bag of words, this comes into play when you're talking about designing a model that works with a certain set of glyphs. So I mentioned before in recognition, if you wanted to train an OCR model for uh, the English language, that would be typically around a certain set of style, around a certain limited set of characters. But if you wanted to uh, you know, train that for other languages or non, uh, you know, like English, non-English glyphs or non-Latin glyphs, uh, you have to then train another model on that. It has its own sort of whole can of worms. So OCR has a lot of other caveats as well in that you make a lot of assumptions. Uh, one assumption is that you're reading left to right. And so in something that's very common in academic papers, magazines, uh, that you have a multi-column multi setup. And so OCR doesn't actually read this in the proper fashion. So in your text output, it'll just read straight across the lines, directly across, and it'll be essentially useless. Um, so you know, 
It works when it works, but the issue is that a lot of the times it doesn't. Uh, next is that you can't actually capture a lot of uh, non-glyph oriented sort of data, like, like, like the, the context of this entire form and table. Um, you know, we have, we have an understanding that these are col columns. We see that they're bolded, so those are likely the heads of those columns. And this data all exists in a very relational format, and we want to preserve that. That's why we want to take this off of the page as it appears and then put it into some sort of, sort of spreadsheet software. But OCR, again, just reads right through all these lines because it can't understand that when it's reading left, from, left to right for a certain set of pre-trained characters, in this case, numbers, symbols, and uh, English letters, um, that you know, it doesn't understand any of the otherwise, other context. So now the output of an OCR algorithm that you may find off the shelf, like Tesseract, uh, this is what you'll get. So if all you're trying to do is just do a case match for a bunch of words and letters and numbers, this is OK. Uh, but this often isn't, you're losing all of the value of the fact that this was tabular and that this was in a table form. So it reads left to right, ignores table structure. Not good. OK, we have this table. Uh, this may seem like you've just cherry picked all of the uh, you know, hardest sort of tables, and uh, I didn't. This is like, again, straight from some of the US tax forms. Uh, if you had to create a template to be able to process this, it would be really hard. You have keys under a line where you fill it in on top. Uh, the middle name there lists a single initial. It's not clear if you want the full name, the initial, whether the person doesn't have an initial and they've just left X as a placeholder. This gets really difficult. Uh, we see then, you know, all the way at the end, we also have a non-glyph, right? It's not a letter or a symbol. It's a shaded in circle uh, for what, in that instance, is a uh, you know, like binary either shaded or not shaded uh, scenario. And so OCR completely glances over that at the end. It misses the glyph. And the relationships in terms of verticality for the keys and values is completely missed. OK, so rules and templates has uh, some instances where it works when you can make assumptions about your underlying data structure. So for example, if you're doing template matching on an ID that is standard across everybody in a given locale or a given region, you can know that for a certain part of your page, you may have uh, you know, certain fields and values that, that exist in that place every single time. And if everyone scans their document and it's perfectly flat and all the pixels align, then all is good in the world. Um, but you know, that doesn't always happen, and it's not always a technical perspective. It's like even the W2 US tax form has multiple variants every single year. So you can't even build a template to match for this one form because it can exist in a lot of different totally valid formats uh, that people submit continuously. So unless you want to make a template for every one of them, uh, you're basically back to manual processing. And like I said before, if everyone has the same form, they all sit at the scanner, and there's a machine that lines it all up, and it's, you know, it's all good. Uh, that would be great, but the reality is that humans are humans and every scanner is different. And, and so even for the same version of the same form, we scan at all different times. People put different pressure on the top of their scanner. Uh, not a single pixel corresponds to these four identical forms scanned by four different people with human, what are totally normal human error in terms of offset. OK, I'm finally getting a text tract. Uh, so text tract. Short, uh, text tracks help us cover all of these bases. It was a purpose-built solution to be able to solve for the pitfalls of so many common OCR problems. Again, we understand that OCR is not specific to any one industry. Everyone processes documents of some shape or form. Uh, and so being able to improve this for an insurance company uh, is just as valuable as it is to, insure, uh, to improve these types of services and these, these, solving these challenges uh, for someone that works in finance or you know, runs a zoo or an aquarium or something. OK, so let's go to text extraction. This was the first one that I saw. So when you're working with a given input, uh, this is called a document in Textract. Here on the left, we see a two-column structure. So uh, let's go through it bit by bit. First, we get a block. Um, it, we'll see the word block reference in just a moment. But we have a few constituent parts here. Every single word is then selected, uh, designated by the spacing between the given characters and, and, and words. Uh, then we also have positionality with respect to the fact that it's all on a single line. Uh, then based on indentation, we can assume paragraph. And based on uh, you know, the given spacing between other blocks or large paragraphs on the page, we can't, Textrax just assumes column as well. Uh, all of this granularity is available just by uploading a document and asking it to detect the text within it. So we see uh, we have a few blocks. Block is sort of like the meta name for all of these different parameters. We have a page, we have a paragraph, we have a line, and we have a word. And think of these as sort of like nested dolls. Uh, the page is the largest block, the, the, the outermost Block, uh, pink square rectangle paragraph is within that line and word and so on. OK, so if you're working much like how I had detect faces before and I just passed in an image, um, that's pretty similar to the detect document text method in Textract. So you pass in an image. In this case, it would be a document, uh, either like PDF or a JPEG or a PNG, whatever your scanned format comes in. 
Uh, you can either stream directly as a blob or use an S3 object. And then your response is going to be a series of blocks, uh, an ID for each one of those blocks, so you can always reference it specifically. Uh, the relationships between all of those blocks, because that's very important for all of the hierarchy in the next example, uh, and then the pages. So you can upload multiple pages. Like, let's say you scanned like a 200-page PDF. Uh, you could just pass in the entire PDF into TextTrack, and it'll process it automatically. All right, so uh, analyze document. Now we're getting back to tables. Um, so if we want to analyze the document text, that'll get us all the text, as I previously mentioned. But now we want to understand uh, the semantic nature of our uh, data in its tabular fashion. All right, so if I upload a document and I call analyze document method, which is different, what we get is only a page. I'm also going to get a table block. And then within a table, we have cells. So this makes a lot of sense, right? We have x by y relational tables. Within each of those tables, we either have a value or we don't. Uh, it may be, a, a, if it's the first column, we want that to be the label for the entire column. You catch my drift. So uh, analyze document enables you to do all of this. You get the inner, innermost text within that given cell, the confidence score, and you get the block relationships. So you can understand if these given entries are sequential uh, within the same row, uh, as well as if they're in one sort of column. So you get that structure in native JSON form directly as a result of the, J, uh, the API call. Now we move on from tables, we're on to forms, the sort of wildcard scenario. So uh, you don't have to specify what type of form is in the actual document. You just have to tell TextTrack that you're looking at forms to begin with. You're going to get back blocks for the page and key value sets. So TextTrack, TextTrack will intelligently find those keys and values uh, in all of the scenarios I described before and return that to you as pairs and sets with given confidence values. So it works in two different fashions. You can call it either synchronously. Uh, let's say I'm uploading only a single page at a time and I just want to get the text back typically a very quick interaction. Uh, you can send the document directly to TextTrack, much like I just did with recognition in that image, uh, and you get the results right away. Uh, this works with, like I said, single page documents and images, uh, very easy, very quick. But let's say you have a 200 page you know, document or medical records that you're trying to upload. Uh, you're not gonna hang around keeping that connection open waiting for the response. So uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna send that in an asynchronous fashion. Uh, you submit the document to TextTrack, it starts a uh, text extraction job is what it's basically called. You can then check up on the status of that job, but you'll be notified upon job completion, and you'll be notified of the location of those results. Uh, typically, they're stored in like S3, or if you have a compute layer that will then ping and try and fetch those results, it can do that as well. So multi-page documents, and the limit upper bound is 3,000 pages for a given request. So if you have documents that are longer than 3,000 pages, you just have to chop them up into 3,000 page chunks, and then TextTrack can be on its way. All right, so I mentioned this before, two column format. What do we want it to do? Extract the data quickly and accurately. TextTrack does this, multi-column detection. No code or templates to maintain. You did not have to tell TextTrack, hey, this is a document. I want the text. It has n or two columns. Uh, it just figured that out on its own. Again, to the table example, what do we want? We want the table to be recognized, and we want the words to be grouped by cell as opposed to just one blob. So what we get here is uh, some sort of object notation, JSON, keys, and values. Uh, so we have start date, end date, employer name, so on and so forth. Uh, and then you would see this for, this is one row, uh, and then the other row would be the object immediately after that. Uh, again, so if typically these, these, these workloads or these workflows go from taking information that exists in the physical world on a piece of paper, and then often wanting to have that in what is nearly an identical form online, either in a spreadsheet or in a database, for example. And by having this in a native JSON output, this is exactly what you as developers probably want this in, to be able to throw it either directly into a database, to visualize it, uh, to do whatever you want. OK, last one, the doozy, forms. So again, this is entirely wildcard. We have not fed it any sort of uh, template understanding or, or told it that there would be the X types of outputs of, of you know, y varieties, uh, we just feed this document in and we tell it that we're going to have forms, and TextTrack does the rest. So you'll get output understanding that that first block is a given uh, subform, uh, and then it has a title, which will be full name, so we see that as the root of the JSON object. Uh, and then we have three subkeys, which are going to be first, middle, last, with a given uh, value for each of them, John, X, and Doe. Uh, and it picked up that the first, middle, and last were the keys because they were bolded um, or, or more visually, you know, astounding, I guess you could say, TextTract, uh, you know, we'll figure this out automatically again. You don't have to tell it that. Great, so it does everything that we want. And Cox Automotive uses this to help extract the data from documents. So they, uh, they deal with various documents when it comes to vehicles, everything from loans, service history, 
um, you know, like registrations. Uh, and so a lot of these exist in very large stacks of paper. Uh, and by using TextTrack, they can actually have an automation pipeline to process all of this. And what this results in at the end of the day is that their customers can exchange vehicles, can get loans approved, um, and can register and, and get verification of registrations much, much quicker because it's entirely automated now. Okay, so some more reference architectures, this time with TextTract. Uh, so we have an input, you can upload a document, uh, you can upload it to S3. Again, this is a really common workflow. This is gonna be similar for almost all the AI services where you have data that exists in the wild, the client generates it. You wanna put it into S3 as your permanent data store or at least your initial data store. Triggers an event, it's gonna invoke a Lambda. The Lambda function's job is basically to say, hey, I was invoked by this event. All right, grab the image that exists or that, yeah, grab the document that exists there. Call the Textract API, similar to what I showed before. Uh, and then based on that output, we can do whatever, right? So you're still in Lambda world because the result got returned to the Lambda, and you can either return that to another S3 bucket, you could write that to a database. Uh, in this instance, what we wanna do is we wanna be able to have some sort of search functionality. Uh, so imagine you, know, you upload all of this data, you know, now you have it uh, all basically transcribed. Um, you can upload that to Elasticsearch. So you can do queries on that data, you can find the exact pages, the exact locations on the page. If you've ever done like a Google search, for example, for words, and then it gets, uh, it returns you to some sort of like highlighted part of a page, but you can't highlight the text, this is a, ex exactly the pipeline that would enable you to achieve that sort of functionality. Uh, but again, because your data is in Elasticsearch, you could do any sort of analytics on that text, uh, on the data, on the keys, on the values. All right, next is gonna be something like form capture. So imagine you go to some sort of office or, or medical professional, uh, you need to put in some sort of uh, data on, on a piece of paper, let's say you put it down on the scanner or you take a picture of it with your phone, which would probably be much more common nowadays. Uh, you can invoke TextTrack directly from the client um, and, and basically use that uh, to smart scan that document. So instead of having the user manually enter in through typing everything, uh, the, the, the person who's processing the documents can just smart scan the document and have it auto-populate all of those values that the user wrote down uh, into their system. Uh, so a lot of really, really creative ways, and then obviously like a, in a medical record scenario, this would go straight to a database and it's just stored for later use, but this could actually cause a pile up of patients waiting to get in to be served uh, because you know documents take a long time to read and write. Okay, uh, next up, and I, I have one more after this. Well, actually no, this is the last diagram that I have. Um, so you input, again, another document, goes to S3, uh, you use TextRact on it, now you don't just wanna be able to search on your data, but you want to be able to understand. This is, again, where the higher levels of functionality start to come into play. Uh, you can use something like natural language processing, and we have services that do that, like Amazon Comprehend, which I won't get into in today's talk, uh, but essentially by chaining these two API calls together, you upload to S3, you use a Lambda that would, isn't referenced in here to call TextTract, and then based on the results of the text that are returned, you can then call Comprehend to say, well, what is the sentiment of this? Really common use case here would be in a medical scenario, uh, one of the fields may be how do you feel? Um, you know, how did you like your service? You can automate understanding of this and then graph in real time the satisfaction of people that come into your business or the, you know, in real time the um, satisfaction of people that are tweeting at you either because they love your product or hate it or something. Uh, you know, the, the, the world is your oyster. There's a lot of possibilities here. But again, the idea is that you start with nothing but an image and with a single Lambda, two API calls, a uh, dirt cheap AWS, Amazon S3 bucket, uh, you can have this really high order understanding of how users are performing in the wild and you didn't have to really manage any of that infrastructure. It's entirely serverless and you're always paying per request or per, per value instead of having to pay for a server that sits there and then having you stress out that you're not getting the value of that you know, given piece of infrastructure. So uh, again, you know, all of the heavy lifting here is really in the, the, the extraction of the text uh, and then the natural language processing. And we have two APIs that enable you to do that back to back and it's really simple to call them. Just they all follow a very similar format to what I mentioned before. All right, so I have a really quick demo for uh, TextRact. Uh, this is actually one that I didn't make. It's in the console itself, but you have to sign in with an AWS account to um, use it. So I figured it's still worth showing to all of you. So the, one of the most interesting ones to me, or most interesting functionalities, is, um, is, form, is, is table extraction. Because I think this is really, really common, and I think the painstaking process of sitting and going from um, you know, one, uh, what's it called, one like cell at a time, is just really rough. So let's see what this looks like. So if you go into your console, this is what everyone sees. This is available to everyone. You can upload images, upload tables, forms, see what the results will be. So I'm going to upload a document 
Um, and I'll show you what the document is in, in just a second. So this is actually you know, like a very clean document. This was generated on a computer and then printed, so there was no scanning involved with it. Um, and we can, we can take a look at what that is in, just now while that's processing. So this is a table um, of just a bunch of events uh, with locations and dates. Still not showing uh, here. There we go. OK, a little hard to see, but we'll just zoom in a little bit over here. So again, this, is, this looks pretty standard, right? Anytime you have some sort of list or, or a table, um, it resembles something like this. We have a conference name. We have a bunch of these event names over here, the cities, countries, dates, and URLs. Seems pretty standard. You can substitute that with whatever data you're probably used to seeing. Um, this is still processing, so I'll leave it uh, to be for just a second. While this is going, it's important to say, obviously, higher resolution images and, and, and documents will always yield better results. Uh, you have to sort of manage this trade-off if you're sending data from your clients. Uh, your, your clients may not always have very high resolution cameras to be able to scan things. Uh, so the accuracy will always be dependent on that sort of thing. But you can forward those sorts of advisories and warnings over uh, you know, to the clients. I don't know if it's that my internet is down. But we'll get back to this, because I only have three minutes, and I'm going to get caned off stage as soon as I hit time. So I'm going to plow through this real quick. All right, so that's Textract. Uh, that's recognition and Textract. Those are the most visual AI services that we offer and the easiest way for you to get off the ground with computer vision. Now, if you're more of a front-end dev, if you like JavaScript, if you work with React, you work with Vue, uh, Amplify is our developer tool chain to enable you to really easily add higher order functionality uh, across the board, everything from analytics, uh, real-time data store, and even predictions for AI and ML services. So the really smart folks over at our Amplify team have basically said, hey, if you work in React, you're used to dealing with what are called components. They're basically like these really easy to use modules that are sort of repurposable. So what they said was, Wow, you know, lots of people like Nick were building entire websites to demo this functionality, but every time someone wants a transcription uh, of audio, they need to upload an audio clip, get the results, and turn, return it back. And so even within the utilization of these APIs, there was further room to improve on, on behalf of the customer. So if you use JavaScript, React, Vue, uh, there are plug and play components for AWS Amplify for all of the AI services that I mentioned today. Here are a bunch of links. Uh, they're going to be in the deck after. What this looks like is it's kind of two steps. You have your repo, you're in your terminal at the top. You just install the Amplify, S, uh, the Amplify framework on your CLI. Uh, you say Amplify add predictors, and then you get this like, uh, basically this, this menu in your CLI that you can walk through and hit enter and decide which type of AI service you want. So if you want to detect labels, identify entries, identify text, this was for a computer vision example. And then once you've done all of that, it handles all the configuration to approve your project to use recognition on the cloud. And then you go into your, your uh, you know, JavaScript app, and then you add this J JavaScript code snippet because you can then import Amplify. You just say, all right, predictions.identify, which is going to point to identifying something from recognition. Uh, and then you want to say you want the labels. So you know, really, really, really easy. Uh, and the folks over the Amplify team have done hard work to be able to make that a very easy to use sort of uh, feature. Uh, so if you're doing front end stuff, please, please, please check that out. So if this is all interesting to you and you want to dive deeper, um, you know, maybe AI services or, or what I mentioned today still isn't enough and you need to go even deeper, you're probably going to be looking at something like Amazon SageMaker. Um, this is the entire middle tier here that basically does a lot of painting around the plumbing on the bottom tier to make it really easy for you as a developer to uh, work with machine learning. And, and like I mentioned before, the scenario where you can, in one line of code, provision a 10 GPU instance cluster and auto distribute your load across the entire, your training job across the entire cluster and have it spin down automatically in one line of code with SageMaker. Um, that made my head spin before that was a feature three years ago, and that's what my company previous to this was doing. Uh, so I'm really proud to be able to have this functionality for customers. One thing that is applicable, though, if you're now venturing into some of the new feature sets, like for recognition custom labels, note that you did need labeled images to be able to teach recognition what those were. Uh, and so maybe you don't have those labels already or you want to be able to generate them. There's something called Amazon SageMaker Ground Truth. It's a feature set inside of the SageMaker platform that enables you to easily create what's called a labeling job. You can distribute that set of images to people either at your organization or to other workforces that you can designate. Won't get into them here, but lots of customers use it for lots of really exciting use cases. And it basically, the total cost of this gets reduced around 70%. So if you want to get started with these services today, here's TextTrack and Recognition. They have very generous free tiers. Uh, you can see them listed here. I can't go into them in detail for the sake of time, 
uh, but they're both available in your consoles. They're available in the M Mumbai region. Um, and uh, yeah, again, please play around with them. There are examples in the console as well for rec all the recognition feature sets beyond the ones I've gone over today. Images, videos, custom labels, as well as document and uh, text and, and documents and tables and forms in Textract. I have more uh, AI service demos here. This is all of the ones I didn't get to today because they're not computer vision. Um, but with that, I'm at time. So thank you again for coming out. Uh, this was a pleasure for me. Thank you for having me.